The Ontario College of Psychologists decided in their wisdom that I am required to undertake re-education lessons. I'm not stopping. All the justifications for censorship are based on the idea that if people think and speak freely, they will share dangerous thoughts. If you don't believe that man can express himself freely, how can he have the judgment to control what others express? Is free speech and free expression in Canada under attack from government plans to censor and regulate the internet to regulatory bodies demanding the re-education of those who disagree? Has one of the foundational values of our democracy begun to erode? Should courts really be targeting comedians whose jokes some find distasteful? Should politicians be restricting protests of those whose views they find obscene? Or, as Voltaire said, should we defend to the death our right to disagree? Once you try to disempower the freedom of expression of an entire class of person, it suddenly starts to look very authoritarian. This is a guy who is authoritarian. When he says, I'm coming to regulate the internet, we should believe him. We've seen countries turning towards slightly more authoritarian leaders. Government bureaucrats will be able to manipulate the algorithms to shut down the voices of individual Canadians. The much debated Bill C-11 passed in the Senate. The Ontario Human Rights Tribunal ordered the restaurant to pay him $10,000. Mike Ward is being heard in front of the Supreme Court Monday. This comes after he mocked Jeremy Gabriel in a 2010 stand-up act. Canadians want the freedom to express themselves without government control. Freedom of speech in Canada, to put it mildly, has seen better days. As Canadians have been fired, kicked off social media, or even had their professional designations threatened or revoked, all for simply expressing views that some feel were politically incorrect. And maybe no case has attracted more attention, at least here in Canada, than that of famed psychologist and University of Toronto professor Jordan Peterson. Clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson is receiving heat from the College of Psychologists of Ontario. From culture wars to a fight with the College of Psychologists of Ontario, Peterson refusing to undergo social media training ordered by the professional association after complaints over his tweets. They listed the fact that I criticized Justin Trudeau. I retweeted Pierre Polyev. At one point, the police in Ottawa were threatening to take the children away from the truckers. Mm -hmm. And I tweeted and said, I'm not so sure that we should get the police involved in taking away the children of protesters. And apparently that makes me a untrustworthy advocate for children who face childhood sexual abuse. Oh my god. You're a mandatory reporter as a psychologist, eh? Your clinical psychology license is in jeopardy because you have opinions about politics that they disagree with. In January 2023, world-renowned psychologist, best-selling author, and Canadian professor Jordan Peterson revealed to the world that the Ontario College of Psychologists had ordered him to submit to a mandatory re-education program at his expense. Naturally, he refused and now faces a disciplinary hearing and possible suspension of his clinical license, the consequences of which would prevent him from practicing clinical psychology, seeing patients, and from representing himself publicly as a psychologist. The College of Psychologists, a bunch of people put in power by the government basically, is threatening to take my dad's psychology license because he's been criticizing the government. Peterson, who has millions of social media followers and supporters, could lose his license to practice. He's accusing the college of infringing on his freedom of speech. Seems like he espoused political views that other individuals didn't like and now they're, they're trying to punish him or subject him to some kind of re-education. Sure, you know, and I can say as a lawyer, I myself have been, I've been on the receiving end of that. I, I had someone once file a complaint with the Law Society because I took a position on the carbon tax that they didn't like. I have a really big concern that a lot of professional regulators are becoming interested in stepping outside the scope of the profession mm -hmm. to regulate private speech by their members about issues wholly unrelated to their profession. And you have a right to a personal life as a professional. The regulator does not have a right to come in and, and 
control everything that you say and do. Professional associations exist for a reason. You know, lawyers make decisions that can impact people's mm -hmm. lives and there's liability issues, mm -hmm. right? You know, people need to have trust in the profession. Engineers even more so. If you're mm -hmm. building a bridge, you don't want it to fall on someone. The problem is increasingly opponents are trying to weaponize mm -hmm. these societies uh, because they're saying someone who doesn't share my political view, they're a bad character. And if someone has a bad character, they bring the, the profession into disrepute. So I just think that's incredibly dangerous. Even people on the left are saying, look, you shouldn't have this power to influence what we say. Mm -hmm. Like we are free people in a democracy. Just because I have a professional license doesn't mean that I can't express my political views. These regulatory bodies, designed and empowered by government legislation, were originally created to ensure that practitioners of a wide array of professions were competent and pose no risk to the public at large, whether they be architects or engineers, lawyers or doctors. Instead, they've now been hijacked, repurposed to enforce political ideology and sanction or target those that resist. In the case of Jordan Peterson, for example, not a single one of the complaints made against him were by one of his patients or relating to any of his clinical duties. They did include, however, complaints related to his retweeting of opposition leader Pierre Polyev and criticism of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. But this is really scary. Uh, I, think, I think Dr. Jordan Peterson is probably in a position where perhaps uh, and I don't speak for him, but perhaps he could afford to lose his license. But it strikes terror into the heart. If you're a regular psychologist who is not famous, who is not an author, now the college comes knocking on your door and says, we don't like your posts on Facebook or Twitter. Well, for the average psychologist in Ontario, that is nightmarish. It's absolutely terrifying because it's your livelihood that is being threatened. And of course, it isn't just psychologists who need to be concerned. I've been a registered nurse in BC for 11 years. I work in psychiatry right now. I've done different types of nursing, including um, outreach nursing in the downtown east side. We're, we're defending uh, a nurse in British Columbia by the name of Amy Hamm. Uh, she has been publicly vocal and uh, you know she said that uh, women deserve their safe spaces, uh, bathrooms, change rooms, female-only sporting events, where biological males are not allowed to go. So she co-sponsored a billboard in, um, in Vancouver that said, I love JK Rowling, or I heart yeah. JK Rowling. JK Rowling's the author of the Harry Potter books, but she's also become quite known for opposing mm -hmm. uh, some aspects of the transgender ideology, mm -hmm. where they're saying that, you know, women should put up with a guy in the change rooms if the guy feels that he's a woman. Uh, there were two members of the public and they made complaints to the BC College of Nurses and Midwives mm -hmm. saying that I am transphobic and a danger to trans or gender diverse people and that I shouldn't be allowed to be a nurse. And this was prompted as far as you know specifically about the billboards? It was prompted by the billboard. The what billboard the, that said I heart JK Rowling. That was it. Just to, clar just to yeah. clarify. Okay. Yeah. Now whether she's right or wrong that's not the point, I guess, if she's, if she's right or wrong. It's kind of besides, besides the point. Because Amy Hamm holds what some consider to be controversial views, her job, career, and ability to earn a living are now at risk. All due to disciplinary action sanctioned by her college, not for her performance as a nurse, but for her opinions and her speech. Basically what were politically motivated complaints against me um, in my case, this entire investigation is about my off-duty conduct. So it's essentially a case about whether or not a registered nurse in BC is allowed to espouse opinions that are outside of kind of the approved orthodoxy. I think legally, the professional bodies attempting to regulate outside the practice of that profession, mm -hmm. when they're regulating speech, that is an infringement of the right to freedom of expression. I have worked for 11 years as a nurse. I've never had a complaint from a patient or a colleague about my care or conduct at work. And at this point, it's untold tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars that they're spending persecuting me for opinions that I espouse when I'm not at work and that have no bearing on what I do while I'm at work. It's, like, it's frankly disgusting. 
the weaponization of previously innocuous professional associations now threatens the livelihoods of millions of Canadians, leading many to consciously choose to not say anything at all. What we can call like a kind of soft censorship, like the self-censorship, where people are afraid of the consequences of expressing sort of contrarian opinions, so they just kind of like learn to turn off that part of their brain and not think critically and just kind of like follow what they're told is the only safe or acceptable opinion to have. What, what, yeah. What's going through this process been to you? Has it been stressful? Obviously you got a, a, a family as well. If you, it's just, if you feel like your livelihood's just constantly being threatened? It is stressful. I'm a single mom with a four-year-old and a six-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And I, ha my career is hanging in the balance. I, and I could have walked away with a slap on the wrist. Mm -hmm. and I chose not, I chose to fight it instead because I just am afraid for the future of our country and for my son's futures. If mm -hmm. there aren't people who are willing to stand up mm -hmm. and fight for rights that were hard won, it, it is a daily struggle and I question <laughs> my sanity. And uh, I, but it's worth it because I can sleep at night knowing that I'm being principled. Mm -hmm. And these are things that matter, and most Canadians agree with me, but they're too afraid to say anything, mm -hmm. and that is terrifying. I will take it as far as I can go. I will take it to the Supreme Court of Canada if I have to. But if the case of Amy Hamm, or Jordan Peterson for that matter, eventually reaches the Supreme Court, what might the verdict be? Well, to understand that, one first needs to understand the source of free speech rights here in Canada, Section 2 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Part of Canada's constitution that is the equivalent of the First Amendment in the United States, with one very important exception. The wording is a little bit different in Canada. It's not as uh, bulletproof, I guess, from a legal standpoint. We have the right to free expression. It's subject to uh, what they call reasonable limits under the Charter of Rights. Unlike the United States in Canada, the right to freedom of speech is subject to additional limitations, such as hate speech provisions in Canada's criminal code and provincial human rights legislation. This legislation forms the basis of the controversial human rights commissions, quasi-judicial bodies that have persecuted Canadians for opinions, jokes, and even, in the case of the founder of Rebel News, Ezra Levant, publishing a cartoon. I was prosecuted under one in Alberta. I published the Danish cartoons of Mohammed in a magazine I published just to show what the fuss was about. You might recall there were some cartoons of Mohammed that caused some riots overseas. I showed the cartoons. Ezra Levant won't be silenced. In 2007, hate speech complaints were filed against Levant for publishing the controversial Danish cartoons of the prophet Mohammed. I was prosecuted, I still remember the wording of the law, that I exposed a person to hatred or contempt. It was the proudest moment of my public life. I would do it again today. It is my position that the government has no legal or moral authority to interrogate me or anyone else for publishing these words and pictures. That is a violation of my ancient and inalienable freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and in this case, religious freedom and the separation of mosque and state. It is especially perverted that a bureaucracy calling itself the Alberta Human Rights Commission would be the government agency violating my human rights. 900 days I was put through that. 900 days. So I did something that may, in the future, cause this person to have hard feelings about that person. How is that even a thing? But while the Human Rights Commission ultimately dismissed Levant's case after more than two years of interrogations and investigation, when it came to Quebec comedian Mike Ward, the case took a slightly different turn. Mike Ward told a series of jokes as part of one of his sets about what he called the sacred cows of Quebec. Mm -hmm. So making fun of people because they were particularly famous in Quebec, well-loved. There was a very beloved young man, his name uh, was Mr. Gabriel, and he sang with Celine Dion, he sang with the Pope, he performed, he was very beloved in Quebec. So 
Mr. Ward decided he would make fun of Mr. Gabriel. And so he brought a complaint and his mother, he and his mother brought a complaint against Mr. Ward to the Quebec Human Rights Commission, which took it to the tribunal and the tribunal awarded compensation to Mr. Gabriel for the offense to his dignity. The Human Rights Tribunal of Quebec is a government appointed body meant to police what they consider human rights violations in the province of Quebec, while similar tribunals or commissions also exist in every other Canadian province. In the case of comedian Mike Ward, the Quebec Tribunal ordered him to pay $10,000 in punitive damages to Jeremy Gabriel, $7,000 to his mother, and $25,000 in so-called moral damages, meaning the Canadian comedian was on the hook for $42,000, all because of a joke. I almost think almost like childish that like a comedian's telling a joke and we're dragging yeah. them in front yeah. of a tribunal and well these these human rights tribunals are just such a weird creation mm -hmm. you know like they're they're not like real courts per se they're a creation of like the legislature to kind of adjudicate matters that are basically not serious enough to go to the real courts because they don't violate real laws. Uh, and perhaps the most damaging thing about, I would say about tribunals is they look like courts, but they're not courts. They don't have the same rules. They don't have the same burden of proof. They don't have, in many cases, judges. They're either lawyers or even lay people running them. So I think that these things are becoming a bit of a joke. Like this does not seem like it's actually resolving any pressing issue in, in our society. They seem to be really dominated in a lot of cases, or at least the stories that make the headline are often these really like kind of like silly, frivolous fringe. Mm -hmm. For good reason, not be taken seriously by the more sort of legitimate part of the justice systems. They were created to be like a shield for the vulnerable. They're not, they're not a shield anymore, they become a sword. They become a, a, a way to go after someone because ha, they'll have a government lawyer chase someone for you. To keep the human rights tribunals in check, all decisions made by these quasi-judicial bodies can be appealed, in the case of possible charter violations, to actual courts. But shockingly, even after the decision was appealed to the highest court in Quebec, the $42,000 judgment and guilty verdict against Mr. Ward was left in place leaving the Supreme Court of Canada as Ward's last line of defense. For the first time, Canada's highest court will consider whether a human rights tribunal was right to award damages to the subject of a Quebec comedian's routine. Mike Ward is being heard in front of the Supreme Court Monday. Uh, it was a really interesting case. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. We intervened in the case to argue that weight must be given to Mr. Ward's right to freedom of expression. Comedy is a form of expression. It's an important part of our expression in in our society mm -hmm. and what the Supreme Court held in this case was that there was actually no grounds for the tribunal to find Mr. Ward's jokes were discriminatory mm -hmm. because the basis for the jokes the Supreme Court held was Mr. Gabrielle's fame mm -hmm. and that was what caused him to be um, made fun of by, by Mr. Ward. Let's be honest, it's mean. Mm -hmm. It's mean. Okay. But he didn't hit him, he didn't hurt him. I'm not saying I'd laugh at the jokes, but that's not a crime. My heart does go out to Mr. Gabriel. Like, I don't think it's maybe very nice to make fun of a disabled child. I think it's probably pretty awful, but it's an interesting comment on society as well. The point that Mr. Ward was trying to make about sacred cows who we can't make fun of, I think that that part of the performance is an important one that did land. Orwell said every joke is a little rebellion, a little revolution. I think that's Orwell. Because if you can joke, if you can mock, if you can make people laugh at the powerful, yeah, and laughing at a disabled kid, you're not laughing at the powerful, I grant it. But you've got to be able to mock. To mock Trudeau, you've got to be able to mock him. You've got to be able to mock powerful people. In a society that values freedom of expression, it is just simply not the job of the government to police private speech and what jokes are appropriate to make. To police the private speech of individuals who are engaging in an art performance like mm. comedy. So we were pleased with that decision. I think it was a good decision for freedom of expression in Canada and we're always looking for wins like that. With this ruling, does it mean the Supreme Court of Canada 
is a free speech court. Will the Supreme Court block any new online censorship legislation? Or does how close this vote actually was point to something else entirely? Going from memory, it was a 5-4 decision in favor of the comedian. 5-4? We one vote away from making it illegal to tell rough jokes in Canada. It was overturned by the Supreme Court. Uh, which narrowly. Narrowly. Um, which to me is, is not very reassuring. How does that happen there? And is this something that, that should concern people? I think people should be very concerned that the Supreme Court of Canada was one vote away from basically saying offensive comedy shows are, are, are constitutional violations. They're not protected by free speech. And that is outrageous. It should not have been that close. It should not even have got as far as the Supreme Court. It is concerning that there were some justices who were willing to say, yes, this is the appropriate role for a tribunal to to monitor and police the jokes that comedians tell. Even more concerning than the fact four out of Canada's nine Supreme Court judges voted to legally punish a comedian for telling a joke is the fact that if that same case was heard today, that same comedian would have probably lost. At the time of the ruling of the five Supreme Court justices appointed by Stephen Harper, only one voted to uphold the tribunal's conviction of Mr. Ward. While of the four appointed by Liberal Prime Ministers, three voted to convict. And since the Supreme Court's decision, Justices Maldiver and Brown have retired or resigned, leaving Justin Trudeau to appoint replacements that, in all likelihood, would have rendered a decidedly different verdict. A reminder that while the Canadian Charter is a powerful tool, at least in theory, for defending free speech, its true power is determined not by its words, but by its interpreters sitting on the Supreme Court. A bench that will likely have the final say over a new, controversial Calgary bylaw that is once again testing the limits of free expression and free assembly here in Canada. We've got a new bylaw in uh, Calgary that was passed recently that people can protest peacefully, uh, but they have to be 100 meters away from uh, an entranceway to a uh, public library or city recreational facility. It's a woke, progressive, social justice warrior, mayor, and majority of council. Peaceful protests, traditionally, they often take place at the location where protesters feel that an injustice or perceived injustice is taking place. The bylaw was enacted to restrict specified protests within 100 metres of a public library, a municipal library, or a municipal recreation centre. The cause of Calgary creating this bylaw, if you haven't been following the news, right. is the libraries have been hosting this thing called Drag Queen Story Hour, where drag queens read books to children. People have different views on it. It's a big flashpoint right now in our, in our culture. People come to bring their children, but people also come to protest because they think drag is not an acceptable art form for children. So these types of protests would be captured to the extent that the protests express disapproval of a gender expression, if you say drag is a gender expression. Importantly, the city of Calgary bylaw only applies to certain specified speech giving government the discretion over what protests can and cannot be banned. This is really important because it means the bylaw is not content neutral. It means that you could protest at a library within 100 meters of the entrance if you wanted to have a climate extinction protest mm -hmm. or if you wanted to strike. Mm -hmm. Any of these pro types of protests would be permitted. But if you want to protest something related to this list of topics mm -hmm. that the city of Calgary has decided by themselves is off limits, we can't talk about these things near libraries, you are subject to an up to $10,000 penalty. They can't mm -hmm. just apply on certain issues because then that involves the state governments mm -hmm. deciding which protests are sensitive and which aren't. It is absolutely not the place of the government to pick and choose what topics we are permitted to protest in a free and open society that is protected not just by the right to freedom of expression but also the right to assembly. But when it comes to government legislation encroaching on the fundamental freedoms of Canadians, Calgary's bylaw is truly just the tip of the iceberg. The most concerning of which has been proposals from both activists in the NDP 
to dramatically expand the hate speech provisions in Canada's criminal code, a proposition I discussed with Trent University history professor Christopher Dummett. What are your thoughts on kind of the increasing the vernacular, the rhetoric around harmful speech or hurtful speech or hateful speech or misinformation? It's a great way to, to censor someone by pretending you're doing the right thing. If someone wants to censor you, they're not going to say, I want to censor you because I don't like what you're saying and I disagree with you. What they're going to say is, you're dangerous, you're harmful. Our ideas of harm have really wildly expanded. Words that used to mean one thing, harm, violence, genocide, expand outwards. They expand to include more things they never have and they expand kind of downwards to, you know, to include things that are less and less severe. There's a genuinely nice impulse behind some of this, right? The sense that society cares more, but the dangerous side is where people use that, that, that care, that you know, appreciation for what victims suffer, and then use that to, to attack other people. In the opinion of the House that the government must recognize what happened in Canada's Indian residential schools as genocide as acknowledged by Pope Francis and in accordance with Article 2 of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2023, NDP Member of Parliament Leah Gazin proposed legislation that would criminalize anyone who quote unquote denied that Canada's residential schools constituted genocide by classifying the claim as hate speech, a criminal offense that comes with a maximum prison sentence of up to two years. The Liberal government, for their part, responded positively and said, quote, they were interested in reviewing the proposed bill. Yeah, it's astounding that this is coming from someone ostensibly on the left. It's an incredibly illiberal, incredibly authoritarian move to, mm -hmm. to attempt to criminalize speech. You know, it's almost a, a separate conversation about what, what is the correct word, but the idea that you would criminalize one side of that debate does seem you know, to have all the markings of totalitarianism. Or, uh, yeah. yeah, but un under the guise of being friendly, under the guise of care, under the guise of protecting against harm, the danger mm -hmm. that people might do. In the name of compassion, censorship and anti-free speech legislation have continued to gather steam, as activists have advanced a new idea, a new concept that now equates words with literal violence. I feel like a lot of these things are stemming from a original very bad and dangerous kind of idea, which is this words are violence. Yes. Because if you accept that premise, then everything yes. else does kind of make sense. Exactly. Like, yeah, especially on campuses, this is increasingly the message, is that words are violence and that you are a victim of words. I mean, let's be clear, words can hurt, but they're not the same as violence. Mm -hmm. now, now, to be fair, free speech is not absolute. There are carve-outs, but they, these are well-established things mm -hmm. like libel, excitement mm -hmm. to violence. You cannot do those things. Those are well-established in law and have been for decades. We all agree, if somebody says, let's kill or imprison this group and that group, there are criminal provisions mm -hmm. in the code that deal with that. Uh, the real goal of those who are behind aid speech is not that. Mm -hmm. The goal is to prevent people from truly expressing their views about subject which some people think you shouldn't express your views. For example, David Suzuki uh, saying that people who are climate deniers, mm -hmm. that is people who don't agree that the end of the world is coming, mm -hmm. that these people should be put in jail. But jail time for speech in Canada? Is that possible? What protections do we really have? We don't have the First Amendment, but we do have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The whole point of the, the Charter is to defend the expression of ideas that are uh, unpopular, that are considered to be wrong or false or untrue or hurtful or offensive or hateful. That's the whole point, is to protect minority expression. Yeah, I mean, I remember somebody told me that communist China, like if you uh, wholeheartedly agree with what the government's doing, you can kind of say whatever you want. Majorities don't really need constitutional protections because they can throw their weight around. The whole purpose of protecting free speech is to protect minority views, which the majority regards as wrong or false. Thanks to the Charter, successfully prosecuting a Canadian for what they say or think is a very difficult thing to do. But if instead of silencing Canadians by throwing them in jail, what if there was another way to marginalize opinions the government found harmful or simply didn't like? The phenomenon 
of disinformation poses a unique and accelerated and quantum threat to Canadian democracy. There's a lot of disinformation and misinformation you may be reading online that's adding to your worries. When this contributes to the heightened public mistrust and the rise of harmful disinformation in our society. We are seeing a rise of hatred, a rise of intolerance, uh, fed in some places by misinformation, disinformation and hatred in social media. And finally today I can announce that we're investing $5.5 million to combat disinformation. Because we know disinformation, often generated abroad, can be a real threat to our elections and it's a threat that the federal government cannot combat alone. Since the proliferation of the internet, the amount of information and opinions available to Canadians has increased exponentially. And so too have the calls by some to regulate what you can say and what you can see while online. Up until now, most of that effort has been directed at pressuring social media companies to block or throttle certain opinions or viewpoints the government deemed either misinformation or dangerous speech, including stories that are now believed to be plausibly true. But for some in Canada's current government, those efforts, in their view, didn't go far enough. This afternoon, I introduced Bill C-11, the Online Streaming Act. This is the first of a few pieces of legislation that are part of my mandate as Minister of Canadian Heritage. On February 2nd, 2022, Minister of Heritage Pablo Rodriguez introduced Bill C-11, one of Justin Trudeau's most controversial pieces of legislation. Now, one of the issues that has come up recently from a legislative perspective pertaining to free speech has been Bill C-11. Yes. Uh, what is Bill C-11 and what are your thoughts on the piece of legislation? Yeah, so this is a bill that's essentially going to empower a regulatory agency from the government to uh, decide what you can see on YouTube. Now, it's not going to specifically uh, you know, prohibit you from looking at things, but it's going to fiddle around with uh, your preferences. While criticized by opponents as a backdoor to total government control of the internet, proponents maintain its true purpose is to simply promote Canadian content, which makes it somewhat awkward that many of Canada's most prominent YouTube stars oppose the legislation completely. Hello friends, my name is JJ. Hello friends, my name is JJ. Hello friends, my name is JJ McCullough and I am a professional YouTuber from New Westminster, BC. Bill C-11 is basically the federal government's attempt to bring the internet under the jurisdiction of the Canadian uh, Radio and Telecommunications Commission. The Canadian YouTuber community is right to worry that the continued success of their channels could soon be dependent on their ability to obtain government endorsement. It is an understatement to say that this legislation has been contentious. The government and the bureaucrats who wrote the bill continue to wrongly treat the internet as a form of broadcasting. Margaret Atwood has said that this bill represents creeping totalitarianism. It gives the power to a woke agency, the CRTC, named by liberals, to manipulate social media algorithms in order to shut down voices it does not want people to hear. One of Canada's loudest and most persistent critics of C-11 has been conservative opposition leader Pierre Polyev. I met up with Mr. Polyev to ask him why he opposed the legislation and what he believes C-11 was really all about. Well, it gives the CRTC control over social media algorithms to promote and demote content based on what it arbitrarily considers to be Canadian content. They've never been able to define what Canadian content is, and even though that, that is the supposed purpose of the bill. Is this kind of influencing what people think by, by influencing what people hear? You basically limit the freedom of choice in order to steer the public towards consumption habits that the government thinks are better for them. The Canadian people, who cannot be trusted uh, to make the right sort of media consumption habits on their own, we're going to steer them towards consuming more good, patriotic, nationalistic programming. And I think the government has always been pretty explicit that it is their goal to sort of depress the bad speech and elevate the good speech, sort of government-approved speech. So there's really no good outcome to this. So it's not just a bill anymore. It received royal assent. It is now the law. My biggest concern 
is that it has the power to regulate user-generated content. People who use Canadian YouTube, going forward, they're just gonna have to assume that this whole system has been rigged in some fashion to serve Ottawa's understanding of what is in the patriotic greater interest. By far, the most ominous of C-11's sweeping changes are the new powers entrusted to the CRTC to regulate user-generated content, meaning any content uploaded by any Canadian. This includes the power to manipulate what's known as a post-discoverability, or where and if it appears in a user's home or search results. One of the things it can do is it can order Twitter, YouTube, Facebook to alter the discoverability mm. of media. So now Trudeau can choose what pops up when you search news, search Justin Trudeau, search budget, search carbon tax. But now Trudeau can compel companies to hide media he doesn't like and boost media he likes. It's right in there. So if the Trudeau government now has the power to elevate and by extension, repress certain content, who has the most to gain and who has the most to lose? It's not going to lift up your content. It's not going to lift up my content. It's going to lift up the content of traditional large media corporations who have teams of lawyers who can jump through all the bureaucratic loopholes. They're the ones who will benefit from this. The CMPA supports the passage of Bill C-11. We support Bill C-11 and ask that it be adopted rapidly. To some extent, it is a zero-sum game, right? Who scrolls to page 10 of YouTube? Mm -hmm. The stuff that's on page page one is the stuff that's going to get seen mm -hmm. by viewers mm -hmm. and if these media corporations can get the government to put their thumb on the scale of that algorithm and get their content on the front page it will be at the expense of new and emerging content creators. Like if this all becomes bent to serve uh, the interests of a certain kind of clique of media producers, then that cannot help but sort of depress the discoverability of people like myself or other independent content creators. You know, and I think that there is not uh, an insignificant faction of, of sort of uh, people within this government that would think that people like me or like you who sort of see the world in perhaps a slightly different way are not just people with a different perspective, but are like actively bad people or wrong people or ignorant people or people that are spreading misinformation. If Trudeau boosts only the big corporations, alternative viewpoints will not be easily discoverable online, leaving the mainstream media as the sole source of journalism and information for most Canadians, who will soon be deciding whether or not to vote for Trudeau in the next election. Something Ezra Levant says is a conflict of interest. He's, in my view, colonized much of the media through his subsidies. Yeah. Right now, the Trudeau government is responsible for about a third of the revenue in most Canadian newspapers. Yeah. And they gave out over $100 million worth of subsidies to the TV stations just during the pandemic. There are more than 1,500 media companies that take money from Trudeau. I didn't even know there was 1,500 media companies in Canada. But if you're covering Justin Trudeau every day as a journalistic story, how can you then take money from him? Are you really going to twist the knife in him? Or are you going to go a little gentle on him if you criticize him? And maybe you'll be a little tougher on his critics. You cannot cover someone who pays you. I mean, it used to just be that the CBC was the government journalist. But now every journalist is a government journalist. He owns the CBC journalists. He rents the others. One of the most essential components of free speech and free expression in any democracy is freedom of the press. Known alternatively as the fourth estate, the media plays a critical and necessary role in both shaping public opinion and holding those in power to account. But ask yourself if a select group of media organizations are funded, supported and amplified by the state while others particularly those critical of the government in power are not, does this sound like a level playing field to you? Or is the government simply abusing its legislative authority in an attempt to manipulate the political debate? Do you think that in addition to the subsidies that you just mentioned, part of the purpose behind Bill C-11 is to basically kneecap independent media like Rebel News? Absolutely. 
you know, some people have characterized it as a censorship bill. I see it as something closer to a propaganda bill in the sense that the government has a conception to elevate those creators and these communities that Ottawa thinks need to be elevated. It's to use the media for explicitly sort of political ends. And with Canada's media landscape increasingly controlled by a small number of large government supported corporations, it's important to ask who are these media conglomerates? How do they operate? And what exactly is the relationship between big media and big government? To find out, I sat down with former radio host for Bell Media, Jamil Giovanni. So if you're thinking about who's privileged by the expansion of state oversight over what Canadians say online, it's the people who can afford expensive lawyers, mm -hmm. it's the people who have a relationship with the government regulators, it's the people who might go to cocktail parties with uh, liberal MPs, mm -hmm. and it's the people who already through their own actions have demonstrated a loyalty to liberal narratives and liberal partisanship. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense why a group like Bell would not be threatened by C-11. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, large media corporations like Bell strongly supported Bill C-11 while opposing a free, unfettered internet with no special treatment and no monopolies. Maybe more surprising, however, is Bell's commitment to limit the diversity of viewpoints even within their own company. Bell Media, like some other companies out there, has a sense of diversity and inclusion that is based on people looking different, but essentially saying the exact same things. It's a very superficial approach to diversity. Well, when I first got hired, there was what I would call like the summer of Black Lives Matter, right? Where Black Lives Matter is marching in the streets in Toronto and American cities, it's in the news all the time. So I come in and I share my perspective on that and things are going well. Like I felt like, okay, they're promoting me, they're acknowledging what I'm trying to offer. And then all of a sudden, we hit uh, Canada Day of 2021 yeah. and it starts to sort of feel like there's this like massive pressure campaign for all of their on-air talent to just bash Canada and they even have like a whole day of content where every show was supposed to air clips of people talking about all the bad things Canada has done that hosts were supposed to endorse this perspective and I was just like, look, I don't believe in this. So I did a completely different show. I had veterans and immigrants and people who had all these stories about how much they love Canada, what it means to them. And I just had a very positive dynamic, which was very different from the rest of their programming that day. And it created a tense environment where immediately after that, I started to get um, all sorts of like odd communications from management, pulling me in, blaming me for things that I had nothing to do with. It started to feel like it was a setup, that essentially they had decided, you're not giving the sort of systemic racism, Canada is bad, talking points that we expected of you as a black person. So we're going to now essentially pressure you to either change or be so miserable here um, that you will regret being employed by us. That's what it felt like. How is that diversity and inclusion? I mean, this is that comes down to the fundamentals of the problem here. You have a black employee, you create unique job expectations because he's black. He does not do the black thing the way they wanted, and then you punish him for it. Like to call that diversity and inclusion is madness. Eventually, Bell Media fired Jamil, citing what is essentially his conservative points of view and his unwillingness to engage in Bell's superficial diversity initiatives. This has resulted in Jamil filing a wrongful dismissal lawsuit against his former employer. They had a sense of like, okay, there's a bunch of like liberal talking points that a black person is supposed to have. Let's just bring in a black guy to say those things. And over time, that produced a series of conflicts where they were trying to pressure me to be someone I'm not and unwilling to even understand why someone might have a different point of view and that's resulted not just in my lawsuit but they've been sued by multiple other former employees in the last few months and years as well Whether at Bell, the CBC, or in the corridors of political power, Jamil's story is part of a much broader and more disturbing trend in Canada, one where the themes of diversity and tolerance are valued in all but diversity of thought and tolerance of opposing views. As the internet, social media, and a historically divisive prime minister combine to inflame an already tenuous state of affairs which is why at this moment, maybe more than any other, it is so important to champion and defend those foundational freedoms on which Canada was so successfully built. 
It's hubris to think at age 20 or 40 or even 80 that we have all the answers. We make mistakes, we're fallible human beings. That's why you need free expression. Um, without it, you're, you're just kind of hooped. You're, you're acting in faith, basically. Maybe I'm wrong uh, about you know, my views on you know, issue X or Y, but the way to uh, correct me is to have an open debate about that. Aristotle thought that words were what separated us from animals. Mm. Um, and if you can't express yourself as a human being, or if word inflation takes away the meaning of words, the actual meaning of words, then we're actually not talking to each other. Without free expression, your only resort to change is physical violence, right? An overthrow uh, in a country, or you and another person get into fisticuffs. Without free expression, you're limiting people to that remedy for a problem. That's not where we want to go. When you engage in censorship, you're basically taking away the one thing that human beings have in terms of the potential to get along better, which is to talk to each other, to persuade each other, to work cooperatively with each other through reason. You take that away, you know, we're back to, uh, you know, pre-homo sapien. Yeah, it's fundamental to our democracy. It's fundamental to uh, being able to have a democracy. There's no sense having a vote if you can't express what, what you feel about things. If you don't have free speech, what use is a political campaign? If you don't have free speech, what use is freedom of assembly to meet together? So it really is the stepping stone freedom for, for all the rest. I heard it once said, take away all my other freedoms, but leave me freedom of speech, and with it I'll win back the rest. Martin Luther King, when he was assassinated, he was challenging the US government and its policies. He was a reverend with no power, no money, but because of free speech could call out the most powerful people in his country. So when we think about who actually benefits from free speech, it's people who want to challenge, question, power. So don't ban an idea because it's offensive. You have the right to be offended. You have the right to be mad about things. You have the right to react to your government and say you're wrong. There's no right not to be offended. That's actually the power to silence your your opponent and Martin Luther King and Harvey Milk and the suffragettes all offended the order of the day. That was their purpose. And you know what? All of them were proven in the fullness of time to be right. So I would say to anybody, uh, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, if you look at history, the good guys always need free speech. Mm -hmm. It's a strange gift though, freedom of speech. You have to give it to your opponents mm -hmm. if you want it for yourself. That's what's so hard about <laughs> standing up for free speech, because everyone wants free speech for themselves, of course. It's going to be the prickly porcupines in society, but that's why we've got to stand up for the prickly porcupines, because that's where the precedent will be set that will later be used against the nice people.